Hello all, this is Dr. Alsip, and we are going to finish our discussion of the regional musculoskeletal anatomy of the pelvis with some of the muscles. And I want to note that we are definitely not doing an exhaustive exploration of the muscles in this region because many of these are going to be considered in more detail in the reproductive portion of the course. But we're going to talk about... Um, one that I keep mentioning, the piriformis, and I've been mentioning in various videos, so I want to uh, illustrate it here, and we'll talk a little bit about it with the lower limb as well. And then I just want to at least get an idea of where the pelvic diaphragm is and what are the main muscles that make up the pelvic diaphragm. Okay, so piriformis. The reason I keep talking about the piriformis is because... Anatomists love piriformis uh, for a few reasons. Uh, sometimes you'll hear us refer to the piriformis as the key to the hip. And the reason that is, is as we mentioned in the, the previous uh, bone video, piriformis is going to traverse the greater sciatic foramen. And then you're going to have certain neurovasculature and once you're out of the out of the pelvis region and now we're in the the hip lower limb region, you're going to have some neurovasculature that will exit the greater sciatic foramen above or superior to or below or inferior to the piriformis. And you can kind of get your bearings in terms of that. One of the main things that is going to exit inferior to the piriformis will be the sciatic nerve. And we will keep coming back to that sciatic nerve as we talk about the muscles of the lower limb. So Sacrum is going to start inside the pelvis, so on the anterior portion of the sacrum, and then it will extend all the way to the greater trochanter of the femur. If you feel the side of your hip, so not your iliac crest, which, which is where you kind of put your hands on your hip, but you kind of extend a little bit lower and just feel the sides there, you'll feel a fairly robust um, part of the bone, and that is likely your greater tro trochanter. We'll talk, and we'll we'll look at a greater trochanter in upcoming videos. So it is crossing the hip joint, which means that it can directly affect the hip joint in terms of actions. Uh, one of the main things it will do is uh, play a role in terms of lateral rotation. So think of that anterior surface of the femur moving laterally or rotating laterally. Uh, as well as abduction of the hip joint. And we'll talk about a few other uh, fairly important abductors of the hip joint, but kind of moving the lower limb away from the midline, or at least the thigh portion of the hip joint away from the midline. Okay, now moving on to the pelvic floor. So we saw a lot of the bony osteology associated with the pelvic girdle. And kind of right at the bottom of that portion, you can see here, like we're looking at the iliac crests right here. Here's the pubic symphysis. You're going to have some, some muscles up in this region that we'll talk about that will play a role in terms of the lower limb. But if you're kind of looking into the pelvic cavity region, you'll see that muscle kind of close off, closes off this region. And this muscle is called the pelvic diaphragm. The majority of the pelvic diaphragm is, in, as part, sorry, before I get into the different parts, I wanted to mention that you will have openings in the pelvic diaphragm for certain, certain structures to traverse the area, as in the vaginal canal, if we're talking about in females, you, it will also have the urethral canal. So you will have structures that will move through this area, similar to what we had with the diaphragm uh, between the abdominal and the thoracic cavities, because here it is right there in its name. So the two major components of the pelvic diaphragm are the pretty small, I'm going to start with the smallest portion, coccygeus. This is coccygeus right here. You can see it also more in terms of where it's uh, attachment is to the coccyx here. So the coccygeus is going to be the posterior most portion of the pelvic diaphragm. But by far the majority of the pelvic diaphragm is formed by a muscle called the levator ani muscle. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is forming the majority, by far the majority of the floor. And often the different fibers of the levator ani are uh, separated into different named parts. 
So you would have the pubococcygeus, you'd have the iliococcygeus. Oftentimes that pubococcygeus and iliococcygeus are even further subdivided. But for our purposes, let's focus on this name here. Um, you may uh, be asked to, to learn a bit more detail in the reproductive portion, but uh, I'm kind of going for the, the big picture here with the levator ani. Now, looking again in this region, if you think about injuries to the pelvic floor, particularly in terms of, say, a vaginal birth, you would have kind of moving through this region and through the, the birth canal region, you could have injuries to the levator ani, particularly if you're looking at the inferior portion. So if I were to flip this all the way over and I was looking inferior, um, you would still see portions of the pelvic diaphragm. And it's often those fibers that are going to be um, affected or could potentially or be more susceptible to being uh, injured. And so it's usually the more medial components of the levator ani, specifically the pubococcygeus, which is going to be the medial most portion. And some of those fibers of the pubococcygeus are, are going to go around um, the rectal canal region and be uh, medial most even more so. So the medial most portion of the pubococcygeus is often referred to as the puborectalis. All right, so it's these medial most portions of the uh, levator ani that are going to, to really be uh, the most susceptible. And that makes sense because a lot of these apertures or these canals or these openings are going to be very medial, almost towards the midline region. Now the perineal muscles um, these are going to be skeletal muscle as well, um, and they are associated in covering the erectile bodies um, that are associated with the clitoris as well as the penis. You can see ischiocavernous and the bulbospongiosis are of particular importance. But um, this is going to be discussed in a bit more detail in the repro portion of the course, so I will save a lot of those details for that. Um, but do note that these are going to be skeletal muscle. Okay, so I did just talk about this, but I hope that um, we, we caught on to this concept. So, during a vaginal delivery, which portion of the levator ani muscle is more susceptible to injury? And I, I want you to, I don't have any options here because I want you to kind of think about it without the crutch, I guess, of having the multiple choice. So, think about those apertures or those openings, say for the vaginal canal region, those are going to be more medially located. All right, so you have this right kind of down that midline region. And so those medial portions of the levator ani are going to be by far the most susceptible to injury. So if you think of um, the, uh, the head of a child kind of extending through this region, obviously these areas will uh, be extended in terms of size, but you could have some type of tearing associated with these muscles. It could even extend back towards the rectal canal region as well. So it is the medial portions of the levator ani that will be most susceptible. Certainly lateral portions could also be injured, but it is less, um, less likely or less susceptible to the injuries. Okay, so that finishes us for the pelvis or the pelvic region. So that leaves only the upper and the lower limbs. And I know I just said only uh, because, you know, I'm trying to be a little funny. There are, uh, when we talk about musculoskeletal anatomy, a lot of people think of the upper and the lower limbs because there's a lot of the movement that's occurring there. There's a lot of the injuries that are occurring there because of the movement. And so we will spend uh, the rest of our time really getting into the details of the bones, joints, and the muscles of the upper and the lower limb, and I cannot wait. So as always, as we've moved through the axial portion of the body and the musculoskeletal system, please kind of take time to stop. Think of those areas where, oh, maybe I need to spend a little bit more time reviewing say the head, there was a considerable amount of detail there. So you may need to spend a little time reviewing that, do a little bit every day, find those areas that are still confusing and always reach out to me and I will be happy to, to talk anatomy. Thanks for your time and your attention and have a great day.